Over 90% of all the plastic that has ever been created has basically just gone into the environment. Dr. Joel Rindelau, you are a plastics expert and you measure the amount of plastic in the air, in the water, in all of our food. Plastics are everywhere. They can get into your body. They can get into your bloodstream. And some of them can have a lot of downstream effects. Things like alterations in sperm quality and fertility, abnormalities in sex organs, altered nervous system function, immune function, certain cancers. Let's say that you were talking to someone who is maybe more at risk. How would you recommend that they minimize as much plastic as they can? Desiree. Desiree. Podcast. Dr. Joel Rindelaub, how are you today? Kia ora. Happy to be here and talk about some science. Nice. Um, now, you are a plastics expert or a microplastics expert, and you measure the amount of plastic in the air and the water in all of our food, like everywhere. And it turns out that's having some pretty damaging results on every hormonal process that we can think of, it seems like, or it, uh, it seems to me. Well, you nailed it. Plastics are everywhere. Uh, everywhere scientists have looked, we found evidence of our synthetic existence, whether that's on the tops of the tallest mountains, the depths of the deepest sea, even the snow in Antarctica, plastics are falling. And so some of the research that I've done here in New Zealand is looking at plastics falling out of the air. And it turns out when it rains, it's literally raining plastic down on you. So what we want to do is to better understand that global transport of these plastics, these microplastics, these not nanoplastics, the smallest plastics out there, and just to understand how they can get distributed uh, across the globe. Hmm. And why are you studying that exactly? Like, what is the... What's the, the benefit for figuring out how they're distributed? Well, it's, it's interesting. Is it not? It's very interesting. Yes. But I, I prefer interesting and useful. And I'm sure there's some use, it's, there's some use case there. Yes. Yes. So it's, it's, it's fun to kind of discover, um, that, you know, plastics are everywhere in places that we might not have expect in the air that we're breathing. Um, so that's interesting. That's exciting, but it's also, um, very, very scary at the same time. So when we make a big research discovery, it's, it's really excitement and then dread all mixed together. It's a weird combo of emotions. Um, so basically what we want to do is we want to understand, um, one of the things is human exposure to microplastics or plastics in general, or these um, additives that are used in plastics. Because right now, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty and we just want to quantify exposure. So then we can better understand what some of these potential downstream health effects are uh, from the plastics, which again, is also uh, highly uncertain at this point. But a lot of the data that we do have um, kind of points to um, yeah, not not necessarily some great endpoints, that's for sure. Mm. Now, the question on everyone's mind is, are the plastics turning the frogs gay? I can I can say that uh, we do not have evidence to support that hypothesis. <sighs> really? Yeah. Oh. I trust it. I trust Alex Jones about everything else. I mean, I, I assumed wow. he would have had some really rigorous research to back him up. <laughs> I know, right? It's it's kind of a shock to all of us. Um, okay. And we might have to get to know. Yeah, might have to, I guess, evaluate some of his other statements uh, for their validity as well after this one. You know. All right, maybe, maybe I have to recheck some of my priors there. Um, so, what are the what are the downstream benefits? Uh, adverse health effects that plastics can cause? So a lot of the studies that have been conducted at this point um, have usually been like mice studies. Um, those are kind of the closest uh, mammalian system that uh, people usually do these types of toxicological studies on. Um, and 
Um, a, a lot of focus is kind of on the endocrine disrupting chemicals. Uh, so these are the additives that they put into the plastic themselves. So just a, a little bit of a, a backstory here. Uh, plastics are very, very different. They have highly different formulations, like uh, your uh, Tupperware food container, why that's hard and brittle. But let's say a IV bag that you would see in the hospital uh, are completely different consistencies. One's hard and brittle, the other one's soft but they could be the exact same polymer that's used to make each of those products. But what's different are these collection of additives they put in the, these smaller chemicals, your uh, bisphenol A, your phthalates, things like that, that give it uh, the certain physical properties that make that plastic useful for its intended purpose. And so these chemicals that they put in to these formulations are vastly different. Um, highly, highly unregulated. And some of them, um, can be these endocrine disrupting compounds that could have, um, a lot of downstream effects, uh, on the population. So the, the endocrine society is, um, basically what they do is they are a bunch of nerds. They get the, the experts, the doctors, the scientists together, um, to, to study what are the effect of endocrine disrupting chemicals. And there could be things like alterations in sperm quality and fertility, abnormalities in sex organs, early puberty, altered nervous system function, immune function, uh, certain cancers, respiratory problems, metabolic issues, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular problems. Uh, and the list is, is pretty long. Um, but again, uh, the, there is some uncertainty here, and that's why we do need to continue to study. But uh, the data that we have at this point um, is basically telling us we need to know more. We need to understand our exposure uh, in order to better understand what some of these downstream effects could be. Hmm. You mentioned a few things that were really interesting there. And one of them that I want to take a look at is, is sperm count, because it seems like since the 1970s, uh, or so I've read, or even before that, male sperm count has just like decreased dramatically, and we don't really know the cause of it. Correct. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if plastics are are to do with that, like are are a culprit there? Potentially, potentially. Um, we don't have, I guess, causation type of studies at this point, but yes, sperm. There are some concerns in the scientific community that things like sperm counts and fertility are decreasing. Uh, and they have been decreasing uh, at the same time that plastic uh, production has been on the rise. So it doesn't mean that those are necessarily related, but it's it's something worth investigating, especially considering that some of these endocrine disrupting uh, compounds are going to be able to mimic hormones. So like BPA or bisphenol A, if you ever go into the grocery store and you you see like a plastic bottle that says BPA free, uh, that is the, the specific chemical that they're uh, interested in. And so what that does is that can mimic estrogen. So if you have a developing um, fetus or a small child that gets uh, exposed to this, uh, it could um, have um, issues uh, in their development processes. So uh, that's kind of where there needs to be more investigation into this type of thing, um, because yeah, these endocrine disrupting compounds can have various effects um, on uh, humans and how they develop. What effects could it have on a, on a young child or a fetus? So how these endocrine, um, I guess, disrupting chemicals work is they can actually mimic uh, a hormone itself, um, or they can block um, like a receptor, for instance, um, which could lead to, um, you know, an increase in, um, the hormone itself, or it could, um, if it mimics that type of hormone, it could, uh, cause, um, these hormone signaling events to occur, uh, which could, of course, put the, uh, development and the, the body kind of out of sync, um, which could, again, lead to these kind of developmental, uh, problems, uh, for any of these, um, I guess, hormone uh, types of processes. And 
as we grow and uh, hormones are you know a very big part of that especially around puberty um, they have a very big impact in how we develop so basically interrupting uh, those kind of processes uh, could potentially have some serious impact hmm. so I've heard, I've heard like plastics can have an impact on for instance rats like I've heard that and I, I don't know how true this is, but I've heard that plastics, like microplastics and, and um, pseudoestrogens can have an impact on like rat sexual characteristics. And so um, I've heard that like this, something about the, the taint, like the space between the anus and the, and the testicles will get like, there's a difference between male and female rats. And then the males will end up having more of a female sized taint and the females will end up having more of a male sized taint. And, in essence, it sounds like the sexual characteristics um, become more androgynous. Is that, do you know if that's, is that correct? So uh, what you're talking about um, uh, is the, the, the fascinating taint conundrum, of course. Uh, but as these um, endocrine disrupting chemicals, uh, if, they, if they do mimic hormones, uh, they can lead to those abnormalities in, in sex organs. So that is potential. Also something like, endometriosis which is where um basically um where you can create um like tissue uh from like the uterus that grows outside of the uterus or something like that so you can you can have these kind of um these kind of impacts on any of these 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 uh tissues that might uh be very hormone dependent um, th this is where these, those kind of abnormalities, uh, can arise. Oh, that's so interesting. Like it, I didn't, I, endometriosis seems to be on the rise. Um, although I have no real ways to back that up. Like it seems like it's more and more prevalent nowadays. So it makes sense that that could be because of plastics in our environment. Yeah. It's certainly something that we, well, the scientific community uh, needs to be, um, you know, investigating more, more research. If you ever talk to scientists, you, you'll know that's probably one of their favorite sayings is that we just need um, we just need more data. And so um, it takes a team to get there. But um, that's what a lot of people have uh, started working towards. Hmm. Is there a lot of funding for plastics research? There's, there's starting to be more and more. So it's, it's a growing field for sure. Um, and especially things like microplastics, nanoplastics, which are the smallest, small of plastics are also, um, very interesting because the smaller you go, it turns out the more prevalent they are in that environment. Uh, but also that's where they can get into your body. They can get into your bloodstream. They can translocate and cross the blood brain barrier. If they're small enough, they can even enter cells. So this is where um, the size ranges that a lot of uh, interest has, has focused on. Hmm. You mentioned just before, actually, um, like IV bags that are very soft. And um, I imagine probably have a lot of like plastic coming out of them as they go into our bloodstream. And it occurs to me that like, very young babies, like babies that are just born, oftentimes get IV infusions or, or some sort of infusion from those bags. Do you think that's having a um, a real effect on like babies that are just being born? So the thing about, uh, I guess, using plastics is that they do have a lot of very, very uh, good uses, especially in the medical field. Um where uh, they can just do things that we've never been able to with other materials. So in the medical field, um, we use a lot of plastics and basically it helps save lives. So you really have to think um, it's a short term versus kind of a long term type of thing. Uh, but it's important that, especially in these cases, that we actually do need to use plastics in certain instances. Um, now when it comes to other parts, like, uh, with the highly consumeristic single use plastics and other applications, um, definitely things that we want to cut down on. But for, if you're, if you're actually 
saving a life. Um, you basically want to use the best material you can, um, no matter what. So, uh, talking about IV bags, so they do use, uh, DEHP, which is a very common phthalate, um, which is an endocrine disrupting compound. Um, so they've, they've trialed to use other different plastic additives, uh, for those IV bags, but they just haven't found one that works as well for what they need. So, uh, as far as I'm aware, they haven't made any switch to a different type of plasticizer yet, but, um, that's kind of where, um, you know, plastics, plastics are very useful. They're lightweight. Um, they're durable. Um, so they, they do have uses, but of course, um, using them for everything has kind of put us into this, uh, situation where they have then just become completely prevalent and ubiquitous, uh, ac- across the globe. Hmm. Now, this is a really, um, a, a touchy topic, uh, but it's on my mind and it's, do you think that all the plastics and, you know, plastics are like an artificial hormone. Do you think that perhaps human exposure to plastics has led to like humans becoming more androgynous over time? I'm not sure we have the data to support that at this point. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to um, make any assumption. And uh, I think that would just be an untested hypothesis at this point. Hmm. Hmm. Something maybe we should be looking into or not. I mean, maybe we just let people have fun with whatever they're doing. <laughs> just as long as people are having a good time. Well, well, I mean, how would you conduct that study? Would you, um, you just get a group of people and be like, we take babies and we, we, we inject a ton of plastic into them from the beginning, like way more than other babies. From the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, from okay. the beginning. <laughs> and then, and then you just yeah. No, that's a good question. There's n- and then, how do you measure your whether if someone's androgynous or not? What's that? How do you quantify that? Well, there's there's facial features, right? There's like, I mean, if 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 you if you have a woman who's, for instance, bodybuilding and she's taking steroids, you see changes in the facial structure. So I would imagine that you you'd see secondary ca- characteristics like um like the taint thing right you could measure the taint although i would not want to be part of that sub- study this is your study um, this is your study you could look at z- <laughs> so you're injecting babies with plastic i'm paying you to then, do it i'll, I'll get you to do it you're the, their you're taint. The yeah <laughs> but i imagine secondary sex characteristics like um yeah even even like testosterone and estrogen levels are um they kind of vary person by person and i don't think they're Someone's testosterone level is not necessarily, um, yeah, it's very complicated. So I, I don't actually know how you would measure it. That's a great question. Hmm. But I've heard, like, I was talking to a friend of mine from, and he's probably 65 right now. And he was saying that, like, back in his day, and he wasn't a fan of this at all, but he was saying back in his day, men used to get in way more fights, like in high school, just all, all the time. And I wonder, like, I mean, it's great that men aren't violent as much anymore. It's, it seems like violence has dropped down a lot. But I wonder if that's a, a product of, of a change of in, in sexual characteristics from from the environment. Again, yeah, I, I don't think there's any data to yeah. support that assumption at this point. Um, but again, um, if you want to write a funding application, it's, wor- it's worth a try. All right, will do. <laughs> <laughs> or anyone out there watching i mean feel free to comment and tell me how you would run this study um with with enough of a brain's trust i'm sure we could get it going and let me know if you want to fund it too i'll um i'll i'll be in charge of the money so yeah it's it seems like plastics as an industry are taking on a lot of the characteristics of big tobacco in terms of like seeding doubt amongst people as to how bad the effects actually are. Um, In terms of like, I mean, even recycling seems to be a bit of a, a bit of a contentious topic as to how useful it actually is. 
or how much people are actually are, how much recycling actually does good for the environment. I'm wondering if you know much about big plastic as a whole. Big plastic. Um, well, I've never met with big plastic, so I don't actually know them personally. Um, so I won't be able to give you anything from that perspective, but I can relay what some, I guess, investigative journalists have, uh, have written about, uh, because it's, um, yeah, I guess it's worth, it's worth keeping in mind. So you mentioned recycling, first of all, um, recycling, I, I'm, I'm sure that we both remember growing up that was, there was always huge drives to, to recycle. It was sold as this silver bullet that could save the planet, right? Recycling. Turns out, um, easier said than done. Um, uh, over 90% of all the plastic that has ever been created has basically just gone into the environment. So that means that less than 10% gets recycled. Into the environment, like less than 10%. Into the environment, like Whether into it's the into oceans land, or into yeah. a landfill. So landfills, um, or things like dumped in the ocean or even just burned. Um, so yeah, less than 10% actually gets recycled. Uh, and that's, for a variety of reasons, the biggest has to do with the economics of the situation. It is currently not economically feasible to recycle most types of plastics. There's only certain plastics um, that are, are commonly recycled. Uh, and so one of the big issues is... Um, the the purpose the functionality of the plastic so as i mentioned earlier uh each plastic is going to have your polymer but also all these other chemicals added to it to give it certain physical properties to make that iv bag um, soft and pliable uh so when you're recycling plastic you're taking all these different types of formulations putting them together and then the end product is just kind of a lower grade it's a lower grade of plastic and so it's usually much easier and much cheaper for companies to just start with what they call virgin materials. So just, just the polymer itself and then make their formulation going forward, adding the chemicals they want. Um, so it's way cheaper and they end up getting the plastic, uh, that they want with the physical properties, uh, that they want. So plastic is usually downgraded in quality every time, uh, that it is recycled. So um, it's not necessarily a circular type of uh, recycling scheme where um, the, the plastic bottle you make is then recycled and turned back into the exact same uh, plastic bottle. So it's, it's difficult. And um, the plastics industry has known about this. Um, in fact, in the 70s, uh, some of the documents that have been brought up um, from the, the the plastics injury, have they have admitted that they don't think recycling um, will ever be um, economically feasible on the scale needed. Um, so, I'm not saying don't recycle because we definitely should be recycling um, to keep these plastics out of the environment. Uh, but again, probably not the silver bullet that we were led to believe growing up. I've heard that plastics that are recycled can actually be more harmful for you because they kind of they shed more microplastics. Is that true? There is potential for that. Um, I wouldn't say that's true in every single case, but um, that could potentially happen. Um, also important to note that uh, a lot of like alternative plastics, I guess, um, like bioplastics or whatever else, um, with, that has a great marketing term to it. Like maybe they're not using, um, a polymer that's pe petroleum based, which is good, but a lot of the times they'll use the same chemical additives, like the same endocrine disrupting chemicals to make that plastic formulation, uh, as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's an industry 
that I guess it would be helpful for toxicologists if there was more transparency. So if they actually knew what these formulations were um, right now, those are all kind of IP and not really openly shared um, about what chemicals are in them. Um, that's a bit of a trade secret. Um, but for toxicologists, it makes their life a lot uh, more difficult because they then they don't know, uh, I guess, the exact chemicals uh, that people might be exposed to. So what it sounds like is that BPA gets a bad rep. Uh, obviously, it, it should, right? But we figure out that something like BPA is bad for us. And then the companies say, okay, we're going to use this other thing instead of BPA. And it's going to have the label of BPA free, but we're not going to tell you what's in it. And so you can actually figure out whether it's just as bad or even worse than, say, BPA. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're just going to give it to you and kind of market it as healthier. Yeah. Well, th yeah. I mean, it, it's a lot of the plastics industry is, is about marketing. So, um, it, if it says BPA free, so bisphenol A, it doesn't mean that there isn't, uh, some sort of other bisphenol analog, like bisphenol S that, um, basically just has less toxicological testing on it. Uh, and so it could be just as bad as BPA. It could even be worse. Um, but again, uh, we don't have that very in-depth testing on every single chemical that's used because there's just hundreds, if not thousands of them, um, at the disposal of plastic, uh, companies. So it's, it's a, it's a very difficult, uh, process, um, to, I guess, regulate and, uh, for toxicologists to understand exposure. Hmm. So we know that plastic has a lot of hormone disruptors and it's not good for us. Let's say that you were talking to someone who was maybe more at risk, someone who had endometriosis already or like a pregnant woman. Um, knowing that we can't get rid of all plastic in the environment, like you just said before that we breathe it through the air. Um, how would you recommend that they minimize as much plastic as they can? Are there any like 80-20 rules here? So, I mean, the best way to minimize plastic is to I, not breathe. <laughs> Um, not, not a highly recommended intervention, but, um, so I guess there's two parts to this question because the, we think about plastic into our body in like two ways, usually when you eat or drink something. Um, so that would be, you know, avoid using plastics, uh, certainly don't, um, like put some plastic in the microwave or apply heat or put like a hot liquid into a plastic. Anytime you're adding heat to this mix, it's going to exponentially increase the amount of plastic chemicals that are leached into um, whatever uh, food or beverage that you're using. So try to avoid using plastics um, with food and drinks as, and with cooking. Uh, but the other part that I guess is, I guess, more uncertain is the air we breathe, especially in, within indoor environments. So most people uh, spend up to, you know, 80, 90 percent of their time indoors, whether it's at work, you know, they're in the car going to work or they're at home. Usually it's 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 indoors. Uh, and it turns out there is a lot of plastic uh, indoors that could be shedding, breaking down into tiny um, microplastics and other plastic fragments that you could breathe, and then that can go into your lungs. So we don't, at this point, really understand the exposure and the downstream toxicological effects of breathing in plastic. Um, but it's, it's definitely, it's definitely a, an area of research that is, that is growing. And so my recommendation in that regard, um, would be similarly, um, if you want healthy air, just make sure you have good ventilation. Um, if you can, if you live, uh, like if the weather is, um, amenable to something, just like crack open a, a window and get that fresh air, especially like in the summer, um, where it's a little bit nicer, you might be able to get some good fresh air flowing through your house. Try to do that like once a day. Um, and also some of these, like, uh, these HEPA filters, uh, that you can put in your house as well will help kind of get rid of some of these tiny particulate matter so indoor air quality is a is a thing it's uh an important thing and it's not just for plastics either 
Um, but um, it's something that I guess as a society, um, and especially through the pandemic, have made us realize that we need to take more seriously. Mm. Yeah, um, obviously it's good for respiratory borne illnesses, but I've also found that I used to live in a um, in like an attic of a house, and I found that I I didn't quite put it together at the time, like for quite a while. But I I wasn't as productive upstairs, and then I got a CO two um, monitor, and it, the CO two levels were like two or three times regular levels, Ooh. and it just it's not something that you immediately notice, but it is definitely can do like. You're just not as productive. You're not thinking as well, more tired. Um, and so obviously good ventilation is, is super useful for that. Yeah. I mean, you touched on an important uh, topic there because that, I mean, that's another arm of my research is uh, air quality. Um, and so if you have high CO2 levels, um, it, it can affect your, your cognitive ability. Um, so um it's yeah especially in places like schools it's really really important that we have good fresh air uh because not only will they perform better but they'll also uh be less sick um which means less days off which means less um parents staying at at home with their kids which means less work days skipped which means a more productive economy uh, so there's a lot of downstream effects and uh, some of the research has shown that there's actually a full letter grade improvement of performance in classrooms that have good ventilation compared to poor ventilation. So basically, um, if we're, if we don't do something about air quality, we could literally be making ourselves dumber. Wow. You heard it here first. If you want your kids to get better grades, open the windows. <laughs> Do you think that has an impact long term? Like if I, for instance, I love to sleep with the windows open and my fiance doesn't. And can I tell him that he's giving me brain damage by not opening the windows at night? Um, I, I, you know, I, I would support that argument. All right, good. I think that would be a good way to, um, to put it. So, um, yeah, maybe, maybe try to use that one next time. <laughs> um, but I mean, that is something that can happen. CO2 can build up in your, especially in your bedroom, because you're there for, um, you know, hours at a time, eight, nine hours, depending, well, seven, depending on who you are, I guess. But if you have two people in there, that's twice as much CO2 without ventilation. So I think, I think you might be onto something there. Does that mean that when the CO2 level rises in a room, does that mean the oxygen level goes down? Like, are we depriving our brains of oxygen? It's you. I mean, you you basically um, are in in a sense, but uh, it's CO two does also have an impact um, on your on your cognitive ability. Um, so, if you, if like, for instance, I mean, a good. A good analogous way of looking at this is like carbon monoxide, for instance. So carbon monoxide poisoning, like if you run your car too long in your garage, um, I mean, that's dangerous. So what happens is in that case is carbon monoxide is actually binding to hemoglobin um, in your bloodstream. So hemoglobin is the stuff that brings oxygen uh, to your body and importantly, your brain. But carbon monoxide, um, what that does is it preferentially binds to hemoglobin much uh, much better than oxygen does. So it more or less displaces oxygen and you're, you, in a sense, suffocate. Okay. And um, another part of your research is that you, re- you look at, I think you, you look at drugs in the air. Is that right? Yeah, we have before. Um, I can assure you it was, it wasn't outside like your house or anything. This was very scientific. (laughs) Very scientific study. No comment. Very scientific study. Um, (laughs) So what we did is we were looking at just background levels of drugs just in the air in Auckland, which is New Zealand's biggest city. And um, we found, we found them. They're there just. At background levels, things like THC, methamphetamine, nicotine, caffeine um, are in basically any major city. Wherever you're going to get people, you're going to get people that want to party. 
And do you think these drugs are having effects on people? And they, so they just hang around the air all the time. Like, do they ever go away? The drugs? They do, but people are persistent. So they'll keep adding to the experiment. Um, <laughs> as we found, we actually found a peak like over, um, uh, like New Year's, for instance. So yeah, there's a bit of a, a bump over New Year's Eve. Uh, no pun intended, of course. Um, but basically the, the findings are that there are drugs, but they're at such small concentrations that they um they're not going to have any um like effect on you no one's getting high just walking around um in the city um unless they're actively of course consuming uh these types of substances but basically uh they're small but there's but our techniques are good enough that we can measure them so we can basically use this um to complicate or uh, complement things like wastewater uh, monitoring. So, uh, here in New Zealand, we do wastewater monitoring to understand like drug use, um, and patterns. So we can do the same thing with air monitoring. Um, but it can be, uh, closer to real time. And we can also, um, understand where maybe drugs are consumed or whether they're, um, passed or dealt or manufactured. Whereas wastewater is basically where drugs are excreted. So we could be looking at two different um, data sets, more or less, uh, when it comes to uh, drug use patterns. Wow. So you can go neighborhood to neighborhood and see which neighborhood is the most fun. Uh, theoretically, yes. Um, not, not something we're planning to do because um, we already know, but. Yeah. Hmm. And you had another study that I read. I only was able to find the uh, the title of it, but it was something about measuring cannabis intoxication, which is really interesting to me because, um, like there there is this there is this kind of issue. It seems like with um, people getting tested for cannabis while driving, while it's 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 possible that they could have smoked like three days ago and they could be like you know, sober enough to drive, but they still could get tested and test positive for it. So am I right in thinking that you're designing a test that is able to test when they're like actively high versus they smoked three days ago? So we were interested in, I guess, using breath as a way to test for cannabis intoxication, um, similar to how you have a breathalyzer for alcohol um it's turns out much harder to do that um and basically the point of that publication was just to investigate the feasibility and look at how well are we able to test for intoxication like we do um with alcohol uh and it's it is difficult so as you mentioned um so cannabis uh, so THC is usually what people are testing for THC and THC metabolites, and they can hang around, um, in your system for days, you know? Um, so you could theoretically be tested days, uh, depending on your use patterns, maybe even weeks later, and you could test positive for a THC metabolite, even though you weren't high at the time. Um, which is uh, a bit of a, a problem, especially as cannabis is becoming, uh, I guess, more popular and um, legislation has kind of relaxed on its um, on its use. It's becoming more recreational um, across the U.S. and across the world. So, yeah, it's actually testing. It's, it's, it's not hard to test and say that you have used it previously, but it's difficult to test and say, when did you use it? Are you high right now? So a lot of, um, I guess, I guess in the forensic science world, you would say, well, we already have a way to test for intoxication. And that would be with your, your roadside test, make you walk that straight line, you know, do the alphabet backwards. Um, the things that we already do with alcohol. Um, so if you believe that those work 
well, and those are good identifier for intoxication, then theoretically they would be able to do the same uh, with cannabis. Um, but there's there are a lot of there are a lot of studies, um, and there's a lot of mixed results in this field. Um, it's, it's actually quite fascinating. Um, you, cause you have some researchers, researchers that say, uh, cannabis is, you know, awful for, um, like driving incidences. For instance, um, it causes a lot of accidents. And then you'll have other researchers saying, um, actually, um, that's might not be the case. Yes. Cannabis, you shouldn't go to cannabis and drive, but the effect is much less than what you're saying. It's much less of effect than let's say alcohol. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, I guess, uncertainty in the literature. Uh, both sides are adamant that they are correct. Um, there are some interesting studies that look at like, I guess, medicinal cannabis users and how, man, I don't know. If you if you think it's fine to do drugs and drive, I mean, terrible like, idea. I've been around people who are stone, and yeah, I mean, just can can we just all agree not to do drugs and drive? Could like uh, my audience, could you all just not smoke weed and drive? Like any or anything, just don't do it. Like take an Uber, jeez. I mean, the the amount of the slowness of reflexes or the the ability to get lost in thought. And not pay attention to the road. Like, I mean, I'm fine with people using weed. Just don't operate a giant missile that goes 100 kilometers down the road. Like, it's crazy to me. Uh, yes. Do not do <laughs> drugs and drive. That, that should be a, um, should be the, the, the lesson from all of this. Um, but, um, testing chemically how intoxicated you are um, is, I guess, the moral of the story is it's much more difficult with cannabis than it is uh, with ethanol. So, uh, again, as a any scientist will tell you, more research is needed. Yeah, you guys just want more funding all the time. <laughs> <laughs> if only it was so easy to get, right? Yeah, for sure. We we could direct there. There are some programs I could we could direct money from, I think, to put more into science, especially like plastics. I mean. I imagine, like, there's a lot of money going for cancer research and heart disease research, um, which is great. Like, it's all good stuff, but it, it does seem like research is directed where to, to places where we know we can get a lot of money back. Like, pharmaceutical companies want to make more money, and it's not like, I'm not saying all pharmaceutical companies are evil or whatever, but they do have a profit incentive, whereas it's not directly clear to me how we can profit off of plastic like researching where the plastics are in the air although that's a useful thing to research and like air pollution is one of the number one causes of death in the world i believe and i'm sure plastics is part of that like there's no direct monetary incentive at this point so air pollution is named by the world health organization as the number one environmental threat to human health um here in new zealand it kills more people than melanoma colon cancer, diabetes, and road deaths combined. So it's it's a massive killer. Um, but as far as like funding goes, um, there's a difference between private and public funding. So private funding, you would they would want some sort of endpoint where that they can make money off of. Uh, public funding um, typically does not have that stipulation. Um, but again, also highly, highly competitive. So most researchers, like we're not sitting back in our just piles of Scrooge McDuck money. We're, we're actually quite the opposite. And, um, in the future, uh, it looks like it's, it's just going to be tougher and tougher, uh, to, to answer some of these scientific questions. What do you think about, um, Boyan Slot's project? Um, he removes plastics out of the ocean on these giant barges. Um, do you do you know much about him? I don't know much about him personally, um, but there are uh, people that are trying to remove plastics, and so uh, we say good on them. Um, but again, it's a massive, massive, massive undertaking. 
Um, so we, we definitely need to develop ways to deal with all the plastic waste that we're creating, which is increasing exponentially, by the way. If you think it's bad now, um, it's just going to get exponentially worse. Um, in fact, the, um, the petroleum industry has recently invested like $300 billion in infrastructure to create more virgin plastic materials. Uh, so this is, this is a, a problem that's not going to get better anytime soon. And that's interesting that we, we don't usually. A very depressing outlook. Yeah. Well, hopefully there are some geniuses out there who are working to fix it. Um, like, for instance, is silicon a replacement for plastic? I mean, I, I've seen more silicon products, it seems like lately. I mean, it depends on the application and, um, silicone is still, I mean, it's a polymer. Um, it just might have different, uh, additives or need or less need for different additives. So it's, it's going to be, um, I guess a case by case back, uh, basis, but, um, I, yeah, what we really need are just better infrastructure, um, more reusable types of schemes, uh, because the more we use, uh, maybe it does get recycled into something, but it's still like a downstream process. Uh, we need it to be more circular. So, um, we're just using less and we, we basically, we need to, we need to create less virgin materials, virgin plastics every year. Cause as I mentioned, it's increasing exponentially. Um, despite all this concern about plastics, um, the impact we have are on producing less is, is very little. So we need to collectively find alternatives. We need to find better ways to reuse. We need to find better ways to recycle. We need to stop using so much plastic in the first place uh, in order for this to have um, any sort of impact on, I guess, the future of the planet. Hmm. So you mentioned the petroleum industry before, and I think most people probably don't connect that plastics are part of the petroleum industry. Yes. Who are historically known for morally doing all the right things as far as I can understand. <laughs> yes, they've, um, they've done a great job with uh, this whole climate change thing that I've heard about. Good job, guys. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there actually are a lot of parallels where, um, I mean, they've known that, you know, for instance, plastics weren't economic or recycling wasn't economically feasible, but they didn't obviously tell anyone that. Uh, in fact, they kind of had a campaign to say the opposite. Um, you know, they wanted to put those little recyclable numbers on each plastic uh, to make people feel good about uh, the plastic they're using, even though um most of those numbers they don't even recycle anyway uh so things things like that um so the plastics um are typically made with like an oil product i guess um to create these polymers uh in plastics um so they're very much a petroleum based product um and so of course the petroleum industry uh would have a vested interest in their continued use. Which of the little recycling numbers is actually being recycled properly? Uh, it depends on where you live, uh, but in most places it's like one, three, and five are the are the ones that get recycled. Mm. So like high density polyethylene, so that's number two, that sometimes gets uh, recycled. Um, the low density polyethylene, that's would be like your, uh, um, shot, your thin bags that you get at the supermarket. Those supermarket bags, like they don't, those aren't very easy to recycle. So it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult. It is, uh, it is, it's a difficult process. It's not necessarily economically, uh, advantageous to do so. Um, so people just don't. People like the easy way out. Um, out of all the little recycling numbers, which ones are best and worst for our health? 
So that the, the numbers that are best and worth your health are going to be highly dependent on the additives that they put in there. So the polymers themselves, like plastics are great. They're, um, because they are lightweight. Um, they're, you can have them do a lot of different uses, uh, a lot of different, uh, physical properties. Uh, but it's again, the additives they put in that can kind of leach out. So the polymers themselves aren't necessarily what we're concerned about, but it's the breakdown products and the things that leach out of the plastics. Um, so again, it's hard to say exactly what are these chemicals they're putting in your plastic, uh, because it's not something that they have to list on the product label itself. So we, it, it's hard to make any sort of recommendation by itself. Um, that being said, things like number three PVC, uh, have been found to have like a lot of, um, additives in them. Like some of those phthalates have been found in PVC, uh, but they could be in any formulation. And could you explain what phthalates are? Phthalates, yes. So it's a type of chemical group, more or less. They all kind of have the same backbone of the chemical structure, uh, but some of them just might have like longer arms than others. So they all do funky things, but they all have like the same backbone structure. Um, and they've been used for a long time as additives in these plastics um, to kind of give them those physical, uh, different physical properties. Uh, there's, but that's not the only type of molecule class that are in plastics. You could have things like flame retardants. You could have antioxidants. Um, you could have colorants. Um, there's a lot of different things that we can put into plastic to give it some sort of, uh, certain property. Um, and some of them, some of them, some of them might not be great. Hmm. What, uh, what do they do exactly? So in the plastic, um, to people, to people. Um, so these are some of the endocrine disrupting, um, compounds that can, you know, either mimic, um, like, you're naturally occurring, occurring hormones in your body. So like mimicking estrogen, for instance, that's what uh, BPA is thought to do. So it's possible that taking, that eating a lot of plastics with phthalates in them is almost like taking a drug, like a, like some sort of drug that interacts with the brain in some way, but we don't really know how. Um, it's, it's hard to really say at this point um exactly what would be the best comparison um so again i'll just say more research needed we, we don't have an answer to that i guess the psychiatric drug probably isn't the right comparison because that's usually something medical but but they do enter into the blood brain barrier and they do the the, the chemicals do attach to the receptors like a drug or a hormone might um Yes, there's potential for that to happen, um, certainly. Um, but again, something that we need to investigate more of and to understand the the actual mechanism and impacts. Right now, we're at the point where like this has potential to happen. We need to elucidate these mechanisms um, going forward. Oh, but we don't know if it's happening. So we don't know if if it is actually affecting the brain kind of directly at the, at the moment, it could, it has potential to because yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've found that microplastics have been in like uh, the brain of mice, for instance, but we're yet, and I guess it's just a matter of time um, to find like plastics in the brain of a human while they're alive. That's kind of, it's, it's, it's difficult, um, study to do. Um, but we found, we've, we found, um, plastics in basically every other organ, like the lungs, the bloodstream, like even the placenta, um, in, in a pregnant, uh, person as well. So it would be surprising if there weren't plastics in the brain, but to date, we, um, just based on the nature of collecting that data, uh, wouldn't say that we have, uh, the evidence that would be needed scientifically to say for sure. But based on what we know, very likely 
and based on what we know on how these chemicals interact, also very likely. If anyone in the audience wants to volunteer for Joel to take a piece of their brain out to test, uh, he will be giving them a $25 Target gift card in exchange. <laughs> Someone in the audience will say yes, it's fine. Totally um, worth it, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, okay, amazing. Um, and you're an academic. That's your full-time job. So you have, you're a, you've obviously, f are you, are you teaching, mentoring PhD students? Is that part of your work? Yeah, the whole works. Uh, so I do lecturing. I have PhD students. I, um, try to, try to write grants and get, get that money to come in so we can actually do our research, um, which is not easy. And, often very um uh you just got to keep your head up there's a lot of failure in academia especially when it comes to doing science most of the things you do are going to fail uh but failure is good that's how we learn things um so we we accept failure um just like uh you know frontier airlines i guess very similar I think it's important to publish your failures. I, I've, I've heard that it's somewhat common in the academic community to, uh, study something and it doesn't work out as they hypothesize, like it's a failure and they don't publish it. But that could lead to other people who have, who say, Oh, let's, let's try this thing, but you've already tried it. It's already failed. And then they waste their time and money trying this thing that's already failed. Oh, yeah. That's definitely a thing. Um, historically, uh, the journals won't publish something unless it worked. Um, but that's sentiment is starting to change. Like with some of these, um, kind of more open access journals where they encourage you as, as long, like it doesn't have to be this big new novel thing, but if the science is, is sound and it's helpful, then absolutely, um, it's worth publishing. So that is something in the scientific community, I think, um, should rally behind a little bit more is all the things that don't work because a lot of things don't work. Um, but that's exit as you, as you said, that's how you learn. Um, failure, failure is a good thing. Um, but, um, it is, it is a bit demoralizing. Well, and it's, you know, PhDs are, are generally very clever people and they could be doing other things with their time. Like they could be working in finance or, um, you know, where you could be, I'm sure you could have a much better paying job, uh, trying to get plastic into the environment <laughs> rather than trying to figure out <laughs> how to take it out or, or research it. Um, but instead you're, you're spending so much of your time working towards this better cause. And then we don't want to waste your time. We really, as a society, should try to get her, like, figure out how to make your time, uh, how to, how to efficiently, um, direct your time towards something useful. And if we're not publishing things that have failed, then we're, we're just wasting some of the smartest people and, and most generous with their time. We're, we're, we're just wasting, wasting this massive amount of talent that's very, a very finite resource. Um, I would say, uh, as being a scientist, I get paid to learn things. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and I think that's a big motivation of why I went into this, this field. Um, cause I get to learn more about how the world works around me. Like I get paid to do that. So I feel pretty lucky in that sense that I get to do that for, for a job. Um, but. It's there's a lot of a lot of factors um, that make doing this job successfully um, difficult, um, but I think overall uh, it's it's definitely it's definitely worth it. I mean, I, I'm still doing it. I could have I could have left long ago, and most and a lot of people, especially early career researchers, uh, do. Um, but. Uh, I'm here for better or worse. So you're just going to have to deal with it. It's tough early career academia, I think. Oh yeah. Big time. Seems like long hours and, and less pay. Yeah. And I think there was a study. It was in the UK. They were looking at 
what percentage of PhDs go on to become full professors? And it was like 0.5%. So like one in 200. Are you a full professor? I am just, I, I'm like the American equivalent of like assistant or associate professor. Uh, the term here in New Zealand is called senior lecturer. So it's more in line with like the British system. How do you get to full professor status? Uh, you hit, you, okay, you hit the metrics that the administration wants you to. So you publish a shitload of papers and you bring in a shitload of money and you graduate a shitload of students and boom, you're a full professor. I think that has led to some, mm, I think more than one professor in the past has, has, uh, messed with their data a little bit and, and otherwise done a little bit of P hacking. I've, I've heard, so I've heard to, to get those numbers up. Like, if you're chasing citations, sometimes I think if that's your main goal, then suddenly performing good science uh, is not your main goal. And not, not you. I'm not saying you're doing that or anything like that, but it, it just does seem like the incentive um, is a little bit skewed sometimes. Well, here, here's the beauty of, of that situation is science will always correct itself. So if you publish something out there that is rubbish like it's out there people that are trying to reproduce that study aren't going to be able to do it and you're going to be found out so science is always critical and it's always making sure that what it has published is the right way forward um so once you publish something it's open for criticism for everyone out there for the rest of eternity so um people have done some nefarious things for their own benefit, but in the long run, it's not, <laughs> you're going to be found out. So there's no real uh, motivation for, for anyone that's a serious academic to, to, to do, to do that. It's a good system that way. That's nice. Nice to hear some positivity there. So do you personally use a lot of plastic yourself? Like, would you drink out of a plastic water bottle? I, try not to no um like i think i still had they so they made in like new zealand they made those um like the grocery the thin plastic grocery bags that um that they have so those they can't use those anymore but i think i still have some from years ago when they were outlawed just because you can reuse them so if i do have a plastic like that um i'll just keep reusing it as many times as i can um because that that will literally saves another piece of plastic. So reuse is a big thing. Um, and I most certainly do not cook with plastic or, uh, and I try to avoid it as much as I can. Um, of course, I mean, it is everywhere, so it is hard to um, do that completely, but, um, yeah, I try to as much as I can. Yeah. I bought a, I bought an all new, when we were kitting out our kitchen, I bought glass Tupperware containers because I was like, I'm not putting food <laughs> in plastic anymore. Like this is not okay. But I'm wondering if you know, so those like plastic recycling containers um, that you get from like takeout restaurants, the, the rectangle ones, are they going to leach more plastic out than like the big tough Tupperware plastic containers? Do you know anything about that? That's a great question. And I would say there is potential for that. Um, I mean, the tough thing about takeaway containers is that, especially if you're, you know, you're getting Uber Eats delivered to your door, they're going to put like the food that's already hot into that and close it off. And so it's that heat that's really going to, I guess, encourage this leaching process of plastic chemicals into your food. Um, so I think that's where some of the biggest risks would be. And then once it cools off, um, and then you use it again later, let's say I, I take a recycling container, obviously hot food was put into it, sealed off. Then the heat's just like, you know, the energy's just radiating in there, just making all the plastic leach. But then I wash it off and I use it again. Is the plastic more likely to leach the next time? Like once the process has started, is the leaching going to continue or is it kind of relatively okay once it's cold? 
Or is this a more research needed type of question? Sounds like you should come do a PhD in my lab. <laughs> All right, great. My experience of chemistry is watching Hamilton's pharmacopoeia. Is that enough? Uh, I don't even know what that means, but it sounds like a good thing. <laughs> yeah. um, great. <laughs> Perfect. What does the rest of the scientific community think of your mullet? Are they big fans? So I, I guess I do have one closing story on that, on a mullet in science topic. You were going to talk about the movie Don't Look Up. Don't Look Up. So it's got Leonardo DiCaprio, Jennifer Lawrence. It's where the two astronomers notice an asteroid is coming to hit the Earth and nobody wants to accept it, right? Yep. So there is, um, there was an article that was published, uh, by like, um, makeup and wardrobe, the person that decided everyone's looks and, the word on the street is that Timothy Chalamet's mullet in that movie was actually based on me. Oh, really? That's amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, you have to keep it forever now and the mustache. It's it's yeah, it's too late to change it now. Yeah, it's it's with you till you are an old man. All right. Look, everyone out there who needs a, a, a chemistry science plastics communicator. Hit up Joel. He's amazing. Uh, where can they find you? I'm on the interwebs. I have some social medias, like, I guess, Instagram, Twitter, at Joel underscore Rindelob. That's my handle. Um, just holla at you, boy, and we can science it up. Nice. Perfect. You are the next. You know who Dr. Carl is? You're the next Dr. Carl. Just keep at it. I don't know who that is. He's an Australian celebrity. I don't think anyone else knows who he is outside of Australia, but every Australian knows him. He was on like radio shows, answering people's science questions. He has a board game out. It's pretty cool. What? A board game? Yeah. Yeah. It was a pretty cool board game. It's like science facts. You read out a science fact and then people have to say whether it's true or not. Pretty cool. This is, this is my new goal in life is to come out with a board game. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Dungeons and Dragons, but for plastics. I don't, I don't know. You can figure it out. It's not, <laughs> not my no way. <laughs> yeah. Hit up Joel. He's a hot commodity and he's only going to get more famous. So get him on board for your projects now and reap the rewards later. Um, thank you so much for coming on, Joel, and explaining plastics to me. Uh, best of luck with all your research in the future and hope to talk to you again. Yeah. Party on. Party on. <laughs> <laughs>